Is it on? What do you think, um, when you think about taboo topics, what, what topics are taboo? Well, discrimination, one. Religion, another one. People don't want people to impose their beliefs on, on other people. Politics. Kids, um, teaching them responsibilities. Everybody is so stuck on social media all the time. People just decide not to talk about that. I feel like I can't talk about that. Yeah, we should talk about it. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about it. it. Oh, that was it. Well, welcome again to our series, Let's Talk About It. We are about five weeks into this series as we're diving into some real life subjects that we all think about, we all talk about until you come to church and then you stop. And so these are real life issues like mental health and politics, sexuality, racial division. We've covered a number of them. We've got a few weeks left. And what I love about the Bible is it does not shy away or ignore such topics. And I don't think we as a church should either. Because when we avoid taboo topics, what ends up happening is people begin to come to church and think, well, my struggles must not be welcome here. My baggage is not safe to bring here. And then they'll maybe sometimes think, if I can't bring that to church, maybe I can't bring my full self to God. And so my prayer in this series is as we talk about each of these parts of our lives sensitively and scripturally, you'll feel, number one, safe to bring that here, and two, you'll also feel this ability to be challenged and grow to be more of who God made you to be. So today, we're gonna be jumping into another, I think, complicated and messy subject uh, that may be one of the most uncomfortable for some of you here today, and that is your family. Uh, More specifically, I wanna talk about the dysfunction in your family. Now, if anyone is wondering here today, how do I know if I come from a dysfunctional family? Here's a good definition. A dysfunctional family is any family with more than one person in it. Uh, The comedian George Burns once said, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. And here's why. Because no matter how large and loving and close-knit your family might be, every single person in your family, including you, is imperfect. And managing relationships with imperfect people in a broken family system can be very messy and complicated. We could pass a microphone around the rest of the service today, and you could share stories of dysfunction from your family. And if we got to any of you and you're like, I don't have any dysfunction in my family, your entire family would turn to you and think, it's you. So (laughs) this uh, this is one of those topics that sometimes we don't talk about, but Man, it affects so many. Some research that struck me this past week came out of Cornell University. Uh, A family sociologist and professor of human development named Carl Pilimer came out with a study that said this, one in four American adults have become estranged from their families. And by estranged, we don't just mean they have occasional awkward phone calls or text message threads and they see each other one time a year. It means completely cut off. There's no contact. Why? Because for many people, instead of having a family that was a place of safety and health, their experience of family is perhaps the environment where there was the most suffering and deepest heartache in their life. And it comes in all different forms. Sometimes it's emotional abuse. Sometimes it's personality and value clashes, mismatched expectations, physical trauma, sexual trauma, And when those wounds are left unaddressed and not talked about, they just fester. There's an old adage that says, you know, time heals all wounds. That is not the truth, friends, especially when those wounds are hidden. You see, family dysfunction grows when it's in the dark. And today, I want to challenge us that we need to talk about these things, the ways our families are broken. Family dysfunction will never heal if it remains hidden. And thankfully, we come to a God who does not hide the brokenness in families when you read the scriptures. When you read the Bible, what you find is God is startlingly startlingly honest about what happens in families. And if you're thinking, well, there's there's a big Bible. How do we know this? You just start with the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Here's what you find. The first family that God created, Adam and Eve, their firstborn son kills their secondborn son. I mean, that's not a good start. 
And then God's going to start over with a new family, right? Abraham and Sarah, they're going to be a blessing to the world. You remember this family? Abraham gives his wife Sarah to another man for his harem. Actually, he does that twice with two different guys. And then when they can't get pregnant, they take a young servant girl, Hagar, and they force her to become the surrogate mother of Abraham's child, which ends up leading to jealousy for Sarah, and Sarah ends up abusing Hagar as Abraham passively stands by. That's pretty messed up. And then you get to Abraham's nephew, Lot, who becomes a single father, and his two daughters want kids, and so they try to get their dad drunk so that they can seduce him into having kids. And then you get to Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's son, Him and his wife, Rebecca, they play favorites with their twins, Jacob and Esau, which leads to this huge family rivalry, which causes Jacob to run away and live with Laban, his uncle. And Laban, his uncle, says, hey, you want to marry my daughter, Rachel? And he says, yes. And so on the wedding night, here's how dysfunctional it is. Somehow, Laban switches out Rachel for his other daughter, Leah. Now, I don't know how this happens. I'm pretty sure alcohol is involved in some way, but (laughs) he wakes up in the morning and realizes I married the wrong daughter. And so the, the solution is, well, I'll just marry both daughters, which leads to this sibling rivalry, which leads to this competition of who can have the most children. And then it leads to this family where there's these 10 sons who end up selling off Joseph, one of the sons, into slavery. And they lie to the father and he thinks Joseph's dead for 22 years. That's just the beginning. I mean, if you think your family is jacked up, please open your Bible someday, okay? (laughs) Because broken families are all over the Bible. It does not hide any of their flaws. Why? Because family dysfunction will never heal if it remains hidden. That's why we need the light of day to shine into some of these broken and dark places in our families if the grace of God's gonna get in. And so today I wanna talk to you about a family in the Bible that I think is actually more dysfunctional than any of these, perhaps the most dysfunctional family of all, and I want to explore where that dysfunction came from and how can you confront it and change it by talking about it in your family. So the family I want to look at today is the family of a man named David. Now, my guess is when most of you hear of the David from the Bible, you don't run right away to family dysfunction in your mind. You think about, he fought Goliath. He was a valiant warrior, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And wasn't he this amazing artist and poet who wrote all these Psalms? Yes, he was. And wasn't he called a man after God's own heart? Yes, he was. And, And isn't he the most mentioned human being in the Bible other than Jesus? Yes, he was. All of those things are true about David. And what's also true is He led one of the most dysfunctional families you will ever find, especially in the Bible. And I want to just spend the last couple moments before we go to communion with you to talk to you about five factors that can contribute to family dysfunction. You see them show up in David's family, and I think we need to talk about them when they show up in our families. And I want you to hopefully know where can you turn to find strength and healing as you combat these. So let's start with the first factor. If you have your Bible, by the way, we're going to be in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 12 through 16, mostly in 13. The first factor you see for an unhealthy, dysfunctional family system in, in David's life is poor modeling from a parent. And this is sadly seen in how David abused his power in some really heinous ways. The story goes that one day, David, when he's firm in his power, he's atop his palace, looking out over the city that he's in charge of, and he sees a woman named Bathsheba who is bathing. And this woman comes from a noble family. She was married to one of his most valiant warriors. And yet David told one of his servants to bring this woman to her, him, so that he could use her for his own desires. Here's what the text says, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse four. David sent messengers and took her. He took her like an object. I don't know how you were taught this story when you were in Sunday school, but sometimes the story is taught, you know, Bathsheba was bathing because she was trying to seduce David and then David was tempted and there was this consensual experience. That's not what it says here. David took her like an object. And he abuses her, uses her, and then after the fact, sends her home like nothing had happened. 
until she sends message back that she's pregnant. And David suddenly tries to cover his tracks. He tries to bring her husband home from war to maybe cover his tracks. The husband's too, too noble to actually go home to his family because his, his men are still on the battlefield. And so David ends up coming up with a plan. I'm gonna send her husband into battle, abandon him on the front lines of the battle, and then he'll die and everything will be solved. And that's what happens. David, he uses a person, there's abuse involved, he kills somebody, and he thinks, phew, got away with that one. No one's watching, but friends, someone's always watching. And I'd suggest to you, one of the people who was watching David through this all was his oldest son, Amnon. Amnon was probably 17 or 18 years old when this took place. Amnon witnessed how his dad abused his power, took what he wanted, used a woman made in the image of God for his own, own, own gratification like an object. He saw modeling of selfishness and abuse. And Amnon's responsible for his own decisions, but I think that made a mark on Amnon. I don't know if you've noticed this, but often our kids don't do what we tell them to do most of the time, but they do what they see us doing. They end up living out what we model for them. Psychologists point out that the majority of human behavior is learned through observation. Behavior modeling is more powerful in a family than you could ever imagine. And David's poor modeling, I think it opened a door of dysfunction that Amnon rushed through. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, we read this. In the course of time, in the course of about two years' time, we read that Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. What's going on here? Amnon is infatuated with his half-sister. So Amnon's the, the firstborn of David, firstborn son, and you've got Absalom, who's one of the next in line, next sons. Tamar is Absalom's sister and the half-sister of Amnon. And Amnon, he sees someone that he's attracted to. He sees someone he wants. And so he knows what his dad modeled for him. This corrupt example of I can just take what I want. And so verse two, he starts thinking about this. He, Amnon becomes so obsessed with his sister that Tamar, that he made himself ill. She was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. That's where his mind is. David made a corrupt model. Amnon, he's following in that. And it just gets more and more warped and dysfunctional. You read the story, Amnon goes to his uncle, David's brother, and they conspire a plan to pretend that Amnon's sick, and when he's laying in bed, to send word to his dad, hey, could you send my sister Tamar to make a meal for me? And when she comes to make a meal for him, then he would throw himself on her. And this innocent young woman, Tamar, she tries to reason with him, she tries to stop it. She tries to fight back, but he overpowers her. Why? Because Amnon knows what it looks like to abuse power. He watched his dad do it. And Amnon sexually assaulted his sister. We read in verse 15, then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. And friends, if you ever wonder what is behind sexual assault, it is never love. It is lust and abuse of power and warped selfishness and hatred. This is what David modeled for Amnon, and now this is what Amnon is living out, and it's, it's hurt his own family. It's hurt sister Tamar. It's devastated her. So the question is now, how is David gonna respond to this? There's been such evil perpetrated against his daughter. Verse 21, when David heard all of this, he was furious. He's the king. He's her father. He's got all the power in the kingdom at his disposal. He's furious. You want to know what he does? Nothing. He takes no action. He uses his anger. He doesn't use his anger to confront. He doesn't use his, his pain to console. He doesn't go to protect his brokenhearted daughter. He doesn't deliver discipline to his foolish son. He doesn't gather the family together and say, this should have never happened, and it will never happen again. And we will do everything in our power to defend the powerless. None of that. Which shows the second factor in dysfunction in this family. There's an avoidance of confrontation of destructive behavior. There's an absence of discipline. 
See, this is the second factor that can often lead to family dysfunction. We don't know why he did this. We don't know if, if David was thinking, well, he's my firstborn son, so I'm gonna give him a pass. Or if David, he was so full of his own shame over his own hypocrisy, he felt like he couldn't speak up, but for whatever reason, he did nothing. And when you keep the dysfunction hidden, again, it will not heal, it just grows more and more destructive. And that's what happens. We read on in, chapter, in verse 22, and Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Absalom is furious. And of course he, he should be furious. In his anger, he's probably fuming with thoughts of dad, be a dad. Dad, do something. Step in. Make this right for your daughter. Don't just cover it up for the name of the family. Do something because you love your family. But David does nothing. David says nothing. There's an absence of any confrontation. So Absalom decides he's going to take action himself. And the dysfunction gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Friends, I think that is a point at which the dysfunction could have been faced head on. If, if David would have understood that concern for the protection of people must come before the comfort levels in our relationships, this could have been, I think, what happens next stopped. But sometimes in families, we have this idea, I don't want to rock the boat. I want to keep the peace. I don't want to you know, upset my child Friends, when there are destructive behaviors, they need to be confronted in wisdom and in love. And sometimes they get so complicated, you need help from the outside, but you get that help. Well, the help does not come in the family of David. The situation just gets worse and worse. The dad never stands up for the daughter. The dad never addresses what took place with the son. And so when the perpetrator thinks he gets away with this, he just goes on and keeps living however he wants to live because protecting the reputation of the family is more important than protecting the family members in the family. And if you're here today and any part of you is thinking, well, I'm, I'm so glad that stuff doesn't happen anymore these days. Can I remind you that one in three girls is sexually assaulted by age 18? One in five boys is sexually assaulted by age 18? Of the sexual abuse cases reported, law enforcement agencies tell us 93% of juvenile victims know their perpetrator. 34% of juvenile victims were assaulted by a family member. Abuse should never be ignored. It should always be addressed. God wants abuse of any kind to be confronted and exposed and brought into the light because we can't heal. We can't, we can't move forward if it's not healed and brought into the light. But David won't do it. And so Absalom, he watches and he waits until the time for him to respond in the darkness is. We read in verse 23, two years later. It's been two years and David's done nothing. He hasn't confronted anyone. Two years later, Absalom's sheep herders were at Baal Hazor near the borders of Ephraim, and he invited all the king's sons to come there to join them. And he's about to talk to his dad about this, which is going to show the third factor you find in a dysfunctional family. There is deep denial of what's taking place. Absalom went to the king, his dad, and said, your servant has shears coming, Will the king and his attendants join me? Hey, we're going to do a guy's weekend away. We're going to do the sheep shearing. It's going to be awesome. Come along. David says, no, my son, all of us should not go. We'd only be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go, but he gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, uh, if, if you won't come, dad, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The king asked him, why should he go with you? But Absalom kept urging him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of the king's son. There is deep denial here. David knows something's going on when he asks, would Amnon come with me? But he's in such denial, he can't see that Absalom is seething with anger. Everybody else could probably see it, but David has blinded himself in denial. And the dysfunction just festers. Go to verse 28. When they get on that getaway... Absalom orders his men, listen, when my brother Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine and I say to you, strike down Amnon, I want you to kill him. 
Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong. Be brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Friends, when you deny problems in your family, the problems will get worse. They will snowball. Problems don't just go away if we don't talk about them. And this is what happens in David's family. It bubbles up in premeditated murder. The dysfunction will just keep growing in the darkness, and which leads to the next dysfunction we're going to see is, is an absence of reconciliation. Things weren't confronted. Things kept being denied. But even when there's an opportunity for there to be some sort of reconciliation, it doesn't happen. Look at verse 38. After this happened, Absalom fled and went to Geshur, and he stays there for three years, which means you got to add this up. Tamar is abused. Two years past, David does nothing. After Absalom speaks up, he goes away. He's gone in Geshur for three years. It's been five years since the abuse was perpetrated. Tamar has felt isolated and alone this entire time. Her dad's never gone to her. Amnon's now murdered. Absalom's estranged from the family. And we read in verse 39, but King David longed to go to Absalom, but he doesn't go. He doesn't do anything. He just stays and thinks we can just hide it. We can pretend everything's okay. We're the royal family after all. Well, Joab, one of David's generals, he could see the longing in David. And so Joab ends up going to Absalom and saying, I think your dad misses you. I think you should come back home. And, and he gets permission from David for Absalom to come back home. And you imagine how Absalom must have felt when he heard this. He's been living away for three years, and now he finally thinks, my dad wants me home? Maybe he's finally going to be a dad. Maybe he's finally going to set things right. But notice what happens next. Verse 28, chapter 14 Absalom came to Jerusalem and lived there for two years without seeing the king's face. He comes back to Jerusalem because David says, yeah, I want him to come back home. And you need to know, Jerusalem's not like a big city at this point. It's a couple square miles, but it's not as big as it was today, as it is today. And this, in this city where they could have crossed paths at any day, David makes it a point to not see Absalom. He avoids reconciliation. He's still living in denial. And now we're looking at seven years. Let me just pause and say, you ever been to a funeral before? And when you're at that funeral, someone says that we haven't talked to each other in five years, seven years, 10 years. That's what's going on here. Well, Absalom, he's had enough after seven years of this. And he goes... Back to Joab, and Joab's not sending messages back when they're responding. So Absalom sends his servants to Joab's field and just says, please go set fire to the general's fields and to get his attention. And Joab, his attention is God. So 2 Samuel 14, 31, Joab comes to Absalom and said, why have your servants set my fields on fire? Absalom says to Joab, look, I sent word to you and said, come here so I can send you to the king to ask, why have I come from Gesher? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, Absalom's saying, I want to see the king's face. I want to see my dad's face. And if I'm going to be guilty of anything, let him put me to death. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom, and he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king. Get this picture. They haven't seen each other for years. And now Absalom is prostrate, face down before the king, face down before his dad, as if to say, do anything you want to me. Kill me if you want, but can we please stop living the lie? Can we please speak to the elephant in the room? Will you finally step up and do whatever you want, but let's just at least talk about it? And there's deafening silence. David never says, let's talk about, let's talk about what Amnon did. So wrong. Let, let's talk about the abuse that Tamar has gone through and how she's been left alone. Let's talk about your hatred and your anger. Let's talk about the fact that you deceived me to kill your own brother. Let's talk about me, uh, my failure. But he does none of it. Verse 33 just says, and the king kissed Absalom, which is essentially a formality. He basically just tries to keep up appearances for everybody else. 
He doesn't confront the abuse. He doesn't deal with the dysfunction. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, I'm a failure of a father. Would you forgive me? I want I to work toward healing. Nope. He tries to cover seven years of dysfunction and abuse and murder with a kiss. Friends, this, this so often happens in families. And again, you try to hide it, it's not gonna heal. And so things just get worse, which leads to the fifth and shows the fifth and final kind of factor, I think, of dysfunction in their family is, is when there was an opportunity to share some sort of emotional expression or some connection, there was lack of emotional expression. See, in a dysfunctional family, it's, we, we don't talk about it. We don't trust people with it. We don't share our emotions with one another. And so Absalom, he's had enough. And just when you think it can't get any more dysfunctional than that, right? Absalom starts a rebellion to overthrow his dad. He gets an army together. He raids the palace so that his dad actually has to flee from the city. And at one point, David, the king of Israel, is walking up the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem, and he's weeping barefoot. He's weeping over how broken his family is, weeping over his sin, weeping over the sins of his children. And in the meantime, Absalom takes control of his dad's kingdom. And here's the deal. Whenever in a family, a parent or an adult is not willing to talk about hard things, kids are going to look to someone else to fill that vacuum of fatherly advice. And that's what happens with Absalom. Absalom starts looking for a father figure to get advice from in the absence of David. And he turns to a guy named Ahithophel. Absalom says to Ahithophel, hey, we've got the palace now. What should we do? And Ahithophel, his advisor, says, sleep with your father's concubines who he left to take care of the palace. And then all Israel will hear that you've made yourself obnoxious to your father and the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute. So Absalom pitched a tent on the roof and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And now the evil abuse that David had done privately is being carried out in front of everyone publicly by his son. Poor modeling, avoiding confrontation, denial of what's happening, absence of reconciliation, lack of emotional expression. It has snowballed to a dysfunction that you think, I couldn't have written in a story that dysfunctional. Absalom takes over. Eventually, David's men, his army fights back and a battle ensues. And in the middle of the battle, Absalom, his son, is killed. And I'll fast forward to the end of the story. At the end of the story, news comes back to David that Absalom has been killed. And here's what we read in 2 Samuel 18, The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. And as he wept and walked, he just kept mumbling, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David finally expresses what Absalom longed to hear for seven years. He finally expresses love. He finally expresses care. He finally expresses regret. If, if, if David would have said these words when Absalom was bowing down before him, maybe some of the things that happened after that would have been averted. Maybe Absalom would still be alive, but David didn't. And far many of us, too many of us don't as well. I know for many of you today, you know the wounds of what dysfunction does inside of a family. And you know that when those wounds stay hidden, in the dark, they will not heal. And I hope, I hope David's story and his family's story is a challenge to us to not wait to say those words that need to be spoken. So what happens in the end of David's family? What happens to his kids? Nothing good. Tamar lives out her days in desolation. Amnon's murdered. Absalom obviously is killed during his rebellion. David has other kids and still dysfunctional as you read the story. He has another son named Solomon. Solomon grows up in this dysfunctional family. Solomon's mom was actually the woman who David took that one day. And Solomon grows up, and it's interesting, as you read the scripture, Solomon writes some interesting words. He says things like in Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your children, for in that there's hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. 
I don't think Solomon wrote those words without emotion. I bet he was thinking of his dad. I bet he's thinking of his sister and his brothers. He wrote words like, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. Solomon didn't grow up in a house where there was a refuge. It was like a prison. He didn't live in a fortress that was secure. He lived in this insecure, unstable environment where it was full of shame and secrets, and that marked him. And friends, you and I, we have a challenge that we can live our families differently. It's not too late to speak up. It's not too late to say, I'm sorry. It's not too late to confront. There's one more son that comes out of David's line. He's called the son of David. And his name was Jesus. And if any of you are here today and you're overwhelmed and think, man, I don't know where to find the strength to really face some of the hard things we've been hiding in my family, it starts by turning to Jesus and turning to what Jesus did on that cross for you. You see, Jesus, he knew what it was like to weep on the Mount of Olives. He didn't weep for his own sin. He wept for our sin. Jesus knew what it was like to have someone try to cover a betrayal with a kiss. But he didn't turn to fight. He turned to sacrifice his life. See, Jesus, he came from a dysfunctional family line so that he could heal every one of our dysfunctional family lines. And Jesus, when he went to the cross, he died so that the darkness that you've been hiding in, you can expose it and it can be healed and you can be forgiven. And what will define you doesn't need to be your failure. It doesn't need to be what someone's done to you or what you've done to someone else. It's Jesus. It's his love. And I want to turn to communion right now as we close so you can remember that. Hebrews chapter 12, 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I know it's so easy after a message like today to leave with your eyes fixed on your failure or your eyes fixed on your flawed family or your eyes fixed on whatever regret you have. I want you to leave today, not in denial over the things that need to heal, but knowing that the only healing can come through what Jesus does for you, through his power. And I want to give you an opportunity to ask for that power today. So I'm going to ask, would you bow and pray with me right now? God, I thank you that you welcome every single one of us into your family, even though every one of us is so dysfunctional. God, I thank you that you sent Jesus to be the healer and forgiver of our sins, to be the light in the world that can expose the dark things that need to change. And right now, we turn to you and we ask Jesus, forgive us, heal us, just in your thoughts right now, if between you and God, if, if you need to ask for forgiveness, if, if you've been carrying a weight of guilt or shame, just say, Jesus, today, forgive me of my sins. I know I don't deserve it. Maybe in your thoughts, you're carrying resentment and anger over what has happened. Today, would you just tell Jesus in your thoughts, Jesus, I don't know how, but would you help me to forgive this person? Help me begin that process God, show me how to have the right boundaries, but even though I'm keeping the right healthy boundaries, would you show me how I can be an agent of love and not hatred? Jesus, we believe you are the solution to the brokenness in our families, and we turn to you now. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you, Eat this and remember me. Would you eat the bread right now? In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Drink this and remember me. For whenever you eat that bread and you drink that cup, you remember that the sacrifice of Jesus can forgive you 
and that the resurrection and return of Jesus is where you will find your true healing. Um, I wanted to pray a prayer blessing over you. Before I do, let me just remind you, if you need prayer today, anything you're going through, there's gonna be a team at the front of the auditorium and online who would love to pray for you. Um, we would invite you back today for the Teens in Technology uh, workshop at 5 p.m. in the worship center here. And then finally, if you wanna to give to the benevolent offering, you can do that at the doors or online. Would you receive this blessing? So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Have a good week.